First session today, which is called uh, Potential or Disruption, Going Digital with Europe's Content Sales. And we have uh, four speakers, Christine Loy, Rutger Wolfson, Charlie Bloy, Ariane Bühl. And it will be moderated by Boyd van Hooy. Good day, everyone. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Boyd van Hooy. I'm a critic with The Hollywood Reporter. Um, and instead of introducing the panel, actually, I'm, I want to ask you to briefly introduce yourself and to talk a little bit about um, your relationship to the digital domain. Like, where are you now? Like, and professionally, how do you see the digital domain at this point in time? Okay. Uh, so, my name is Rutger Wollofsson. Um, I have been director of the Rotterdam Film Festival for eight years. I quit this year and at the festival we were always looking to see what kind of new possibilities these new technologies have for uh, supporting artistic film. And since then I've been involved uh, among other things uh, with the Sonar Festival in Barcelona which is a enormous uh, music festival and creative technology festival and they teamed up this year for the first time with the Atlantida Film Festival which is a VOD uh, film festival in Spain. Uh, incredibly uh, successful festival and it was um, quite interesting to see that these two very different festivals, one online uh, video demand festival and one like offline music festival, how they teamed up to, uh, to become partners. Um, well, hi, so um, I'm working at, at Gaumont in the Department of International Sales. So our main focus is to sell our current films and library to local distributors for all rights, like theatrically, uh, video, TV, and VOD, of course. But in, inside of this, we decided to focus more and more on digital sales directly to platforms or to aggregators. And well, basically, I'm in charge of those digital sales for Gaumont internationally. Uh, I am uh, so Christine Eloy. I'm heading Europa Distribution. Uh, it's the European network of independent film distributors, so the guys that are releasing the films we are talking about. Um, so, um, of course, um, because they are buying mainly all rights, uh, they are releasing the films, uh, their films uh, online. I uh, hope to make some money there, even if for the moment it's small. So, yeah, of course, we are very, very busy with uh, the online world and how it could be uh, better developed in a positive way for us. Hi, everyone. My name is Charlie Bloy from Film Export UK. Not Film Export, as it may say in your program. Um, we are a trade association for the sales companies. I prefer companies to agents. Sales companies that are um, based in the, in the UK. We have some members who are uh, you would more likely associate with other countries, but they have offices or uh, significant salespeople in the UK. So um, those would be people like Pathé and Fortissimo, uh, normally associated with outside the UK, but uh, within the UK, companies like Hanway, Bankside, Protagonist, um, very uh, prominent sales companies. And I think it's, pro it's fair to say, although there are sales companies dotted around Europe, that the two main concentrations, hubs for sales agencies are in London and Paris. What my members say to me is that um, online sales services are becoming interesting, but they're not nearly compensating for the loss of DVD, that um, online has cannibalized DVD, and that there's a very difficult landscape out there. But as ever, ancillary sales are better if the film has performed well theatrically in the first place. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the situation now. Um, and I think you might be the person that is like closest in touch with um, digital sales and um, how have you seen that evolve? Can, can you talk a little bit about, about um, that? You know, we decided like to, um, uh, to have someone in charge of digital sales by themselves because we are feeling that it will be in a way part of the future. So that's why it was really important for us to be there actually and learn how the market is going and how is it is evolving and it's you can only learn by doing things so that's why we we decide to 
to work like this. But actually, Charlie is right. Is like today, um, VOD revenues are really small compared to the revenues of all rights deals with local distributors. So, and it's not even compensating the um, the um, video uh, loss, of course. But um, we need to be there anyway. And what I'm just looking at today with the sales I've been making is that if you, the, uh, actually, the question is not that much about giving access because actually that's what we do. Like with international sales, our goal is to make the film available everywhere. It's really what we want. So on that part, we agree with the strategy of the European Commission. But actually, what I've been just um, seeing is that if you're not really pushing the film and working on a film locally with, um, with the local culture, the local markets, basically nothing happens. It's like some titles, I've been putting them on platforms, but I don't have the means to work locally on every territory, so I do what I can, but I'm, only, I'm alone today to do this, so it's quite complicated. But anyway, what we are seeing is that it's not enough to make the film available out there you need to have local work to support it and to um, talk about it, uh, given the local culture, habits, and, and everything. It's like I was saying uh, earlier that as a moviegoer myself, when I have to choose the film that I will go and see on Friday night or anything, I will choose this film because, I don't know, I have heard the director on the local radio that I'm he hearing in the morning, or I will have read something in the press or anything, but that's what makes the film seen, and it's just not about putting it on a platform, it's about like working locally on it and pushing it locally, which the dis is the job of the distributors, which are so important in the chain and the life of the film internationally, basically. Um, obviously, yeah, there's, there's a big job for distributors there. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, where do you see um, like the, the boundary of the job of the distributor, especially when we're talking about movies that are going to be accessible from everywhere? I mean, it's, it's a complicated thing. I think if you're, if, you're, if you're buying a movie for one territory, I mean, you're just going to work on that territory, I suppose. So. Yes, of course, um, and it makes sense because as a distributor, so you, you pay to have access to the rights, and then of course you pay also for the promotion, the press, to make the film exist everywhere. Uh, of course, theatres are for sure certainly now the bigger uh, place where you can exploit your film, unfortunately, because TV deals are going down or are gone. It, of course, it's Europe, so it's fragmented. situation is very different from a country to another. Um, DVD is very bad, uh, Blu-ray never <laughs> was good. And VOD, again, it's really depending from a country to another. If you take Italy, for example, when the infrastructure is not solid enough, yeah, of course it has problems to develop because just of a very technical problem in the beginning. And then in Lithuania, you don't have any VOD platform from what I know. And then you have, of course, bigger country like France or the UK where you have many. You have countries like mine, Belgium, where have, you have several because you have several languages. So the reality is very different. And the, so the, the, the job of the distributor is, of course, to uh, explore the reality he knows the best. The best, because he has this experience in you know, how to negotiate with media because he has also a lineup, so it's not only you know negotiating one title; it's negotiating a coherent uh, catalog. You know, mainly distributors they are following authors. You know, you will follow Ken Loach, you will follow the Darden Brothers, etc., etc. Not only, of course, but I mean there, there is a coherence. Uh, the thing is that because uh, you don't have that safety net you had before with uh, TV deals and and DVD, uh, and that was still an obvious thing like 15 years ago. Uh, the only place where you can now recoup your investment is theatre and VOD. So it is extremely important that we have exclusivity and territorial exclusivity because if we lose that ability to recoup the work we've done, 
yeah, but then it's just unworkable. You can't do it for free. You know, I, I, I like to think that uh, the independent distributors I represent are like, you know, cinephile entrepreneurs. So ne you need to be cinephile because you, you know that, that movie I want to defend in. I can do something on my country on that because I will do that, that, and that. And you have a team that is really involved and passionate uh, mostly that will defend that movie in that particular territory. So you can say, okay, I'm, I'm not I'm gambling. You know, you're a gambler if you're a distributor too. But I'm a cinephile. I know that. I believe in it. I take the movie. And you're an entrepreneur because you have sort of think about, okay, I will put movie to buy that film. So I have to be able then to sell the film in the theaters, well, hopefully in TV and DVD and on VOD. And the thing is that uh, today, because um, a legitimate, I think, uh, demand from the commission to improve access, this really tricky part of the business is even more at risk. And that, of course, has a lot of consequences on financing, but also ac real access to the film. And because the independent are the ones releasing the European movies on cultural diversity and so, and so on and so on, it's a domino effect. You know, you touch one and it's an ecosystem too. I guess you have all seen the uh, Darwin nightmare. It's the same. We are not fish. We are distributor, but it's the same. You know, you touch something and then the ecosystem is ruined. So I guess that the important thing is to have conscience that every part of the model as it exists today makes sense. Without sales agent, you can't have a job. Without distributor, you can't. Without, without theaters, you can't. Without festival to promote the film because there are brands, you can't. So every part makes sense, need to be defended, need to be fair remunerated, creators, but us too, everyone. And it's too fragile to just kick in. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't do anything to support. I think that's what Ariane was saying, that they are also now dealing with uh, VOD sales. Of course, when, if, I, if I understood well, when there is no distributor, so that you know, in these countries, the films will also be there. That's very important, and that's something that must go on and will be developed, I guess. Um, but do you feel, and I mean, this is a question for both of you, actually, do you feel that the distributors um, and the sales agents are paying enough attention to VOD and the potential that there is? At this moment, because I mean, well, actually, I think we pay attention since I'm there, basically. <laughs> so yeah, of course, we know that it's important. And actually, some platforms operating on several territories are also working hard to promote the films which have not been theatrically released. So it's it's harder for a film which have not been theatrically released to exist among all the films, and and some are are doing this. So. It's, it's worth it to, to work on it, and anyway, it's better to have the film on the platform, on the right platform, than nothing if the film hasn't been sold, so it is important. But um, we also need to support, in any way, the um, local forces, uh, the local cinema forces that will push and accompany the, the films locally. It, yeah, I think it's, it's not a question of ignoring the, the VOD platforms. The, the, the point is, how are the public discovering the product that's there? It's not about, it's not a, 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 if there is a problem, it's not about access, it's about creating an appetite. And uh, as has been said before, that, that is normally done most effectively locally. Um, if you think about, the, the name keeps cropping up, if you think about Netflix, what product do they promote. They promote their original uh, material, the stuff that they have fully, fully funded and that they have exclusively. Netflix are putting their money into, their, uh, into promoting their, their stuff where they have exclusivity. Exclusivity is the, is the lifeblood. I think in going back to what we heard from um, Mr. Ansip just now, I think a lot of his um, diagnosis. I mean, he was talking about big data mining telling him when he's going to have a, a stroke. Well, from a, a medical point of view, his analysis, his diagnosis may be correct, but uh, the, the course of treatment that he's proposing certainly isn't. It reminds me of when, you know, Granny's getting a bit old and the doctor says, we're going to give her a big shot of morphine now. We're doing it to put her out of her pain, but the side effect may be death. And that feels to me like what we're getting from the, from the commission. You know, the operation was a great success and the patient died. <laughs> so, um, and, and one of the other points, I'd, I, I mean, I think that we're talking here about independent films and independent film financing. But I think we have to remember that 
it's, it's not a kind of us and them thing. Well, if it is an us and them, it's the film industry versus the people who live by algorithms. The Hollywood studios are not in favor of digital single market. You might think that they are the entities most well equipped to take advantage, but they, they're not uh, in favor because they see the film business as an ecosystem and a healthy, independent film culture in any country or any continent or means that new talent is coming up. A lot of independent films are unsuccessful there and people say, well, surely it's a market failure that people keep putting money into movies that nobody wants to see. In the film business, we do our R&D in public. We make our prototypes and we put them out there and maybe the film didn't work, but the director was good or the star was good. And today's young talent getting a break will be in a blockbuster three or four years from now. And the studios know that. They know that if these recommendations, these, these plans, kill off the independent film business, it's killing off the whole business. Wow, how to follow that. Um, <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about Netflix, which you already mentioned. Um, and I'm assuming that um, we're then talking about a sort of coexistence, because I mean, you don't want to exclusively put it in Netflix in one country. Um, but is Netflix something that it, that is good for European cinema? It, it's Could someone a to European sell to, Netflix but exist? remember, Netflix is a, is a subscription operation. They're not going to absorb everything. Not, they don't want to take everything. They, they say they're a curated service. Um, I believe they've expressed an ambition that they want to have 50% of their own product, which basically means buying it early, early stage, negative pickup early in, in the process. But it certainly could never um, replace the ecosystem we have now. And for, there's a, I know there's a, a lot of filmmakers in the audience. How many, um, is, it, is it a better world, even a fragmented world, when you've got 100 people to say no rather than one person to say no? Um, a, a consolidation of um, the market that ends up with three or four places to go means that you've homogenized um, content, algorithms are telling for them what to buy, and the diversity has gone out of the business. And also, well, we spoke, uh, found there was a, a question about transparency this morning. Uh, actually, uh, we don't know really what Netflix is doing. We know that in France it's not that successful. Um, and also, I want to remain, uh, remind again, you know, a local business is important. It's not only why should we have abs must have like that global European player. We have a lot of local player that do know also their um, their audience as VOD uh, uh, platforms can go do a good job to editorialize the content to touch their local audiences. And there are many you know things that are developed today because also you know. I don't know, in French we said, il faut pas mettre la charrue avant les bœufs. I know there was something in English, but I forgot it. It was the horse before the car or something like that, or the dog before the whatever. Uh, but, you know, you get the idea, I guess, is that it's still evolving. It's like, you know, in the online world, for, certainly for the visual, it's like a teenage person. So it's really difficult to control from the moment. You have pirates, uh, you have no transparency. So it's also, you know, we, you were asking before, um, all uh, distributors, actors are, are, are dealing with VOD. I guess they were first in the, like a learning phase, like, okay, or will we, we, we explore all titles at best on, the, on these uh, new uh, supports, you know? So that was something to do. And they are moving a lot. There are even distributors that are uh, opening their own VOD platforms. Uh, it's the case for Universine, for example, but also for very smaller actors. Yeah, and I just, just wanted to... Uh, also to raise the fact that even Netflix has understood the importance of diversity and local culture because like, they are producing locally now. So it, it means that it's, it is important and it makes sense to adapt and to work on the, the films and the projects really uh, with the local culture and market. Yeah, I think in general the whole, the whole discussion is is uh, on the industry side a little bit too much uh, on the defensive. Uh, I think when we talk about Netflix, um, 
it's a good example. It's an example of what we can copy and learn to support uh, artistic film in Europe. I mean, there are local VOD platforms. Some of them are united in this Eurovolt group, and there, I think there, there's huge potential for, for them to become one brand uh, and it st still uh, offer the, the films very on a very local level to, to tap into the local audiences. Um, most of these platforms are owned by uh, filmmakers or rights holders, so there's not the mentality, ruthless capitalist mentality that's behind Netflix. This is actually people who care about the films. They own the platforms. So there's there's room to for these platforms to grow, to maybe grow into one brand and for that brand to become an alternative to uh, to Netflix. So so what I'm saying is that you're constantly in this discussion. It's very, it's always a very defensive discussion when we talk about digital single market or talk about Netflix. But there's opportunities there. You know, but I think actually, I think more than opening everything, um, I think the the good way to um, work not against Netflix but to build competitors, yes. European competitors, is to support those platforms. Actually, but I think that the priority should be to support those platforms more than. The more than just uh, cancel the geo-blocking or anything. It's like, I think it would be much better because I, I want my content to be out there. So if the platforms have the means to, to get the title from me and to put them online, it's just perfect. Yeah. It's maybe, it's not that easy for them as well. So I think that which would the best thing to do is to help them. But surely what we also want, we want the numbers, we want the statistics. Um, we're looking at a situation where the oldest medium, the ci cinema medium, feature films, at least 100 years old, and we have instant statistics about how many went, people saw the movie and what they paid. We had I indifferent numbers for um, rental and DVD uh, back in their day. We get some statistics for TV. We get nothing for VOD, you, you get, there's no charts, there's no knowledge, and if you look back, the reason why we have box office statistics historically is that every country came to the conclusion that this was a cash business and that people were dodging tax. Basically, box office statistics were created in most places as a reason to stop the, the cinemas uh, fiddling the books. Now we're in a situation now where a lot of these big players are under scrutiny because of their tax arrangements. Um, I, I think there's every reason from a public policy point of view, but also from the point of view of filmmakers, to know who's watching what on, DV on, yeah. on online. Actually, platforms are, are doing it. It's like you don't have any information from, from Netflix, for example, or an SVOD platform who will pay a flat fee, for example. They, they won't care about giving you numbers, but for all the others, like on on TV and on SEST, we still get this information. And even if on you're the SVOD, rights holder, but we have some like uh, statements, even for SVOD from the platform. So some of them, I mean, not Netflix, but some of them are giving us these uh, information. And actually, that's why we wanted to make those direct deals with platforms. Is not that much even for money, like, we, we know that, well, anyway, <laughs> but uh, it's to learn about the market and see how it which goes and how many films right are watched and which films are watched, and we have this information, that's why we do it. But is, is it publicly available? Because I don't think it is, and, and we can make our decisions about what films to make and what uh, films to invest in if that material, if that if those numbers are out there in the same way that theatrical box office is. Well, actually, it's not a problem for me to <laughs> give it you. No, but I think that, that it's very interesting that, especially the, v the SVOD services don't want their numbers to be public. I mean, what do it they have to hide? It depends on the services, but of course Netflix won't give you anything. I mean, how as a sales agent can you make a deal with Netflix to put your movie out there if you don't know what kind of numbers well, they have? Well, actually, we, we don't have a deal with Netflix for our, our future films. Um, so, no, our priority is to really have this information so we avoid flight deals as much as we can. No, because I'm thinking about the, the woman that was in the audience earlier who said, my, you know, there's 26,000 comments on my US Netflix yeah. uh, or my movie that is on US Netflix, but she's never seen a penny. I mean, and what kind of deal could that be? Well, that's, I mean, that's, presum <laughs> Presumably she had an all rights deal with someone and they're, they're still paying off the, the, the costs of the uh, previous media up the line. That's not... Um, uh, it, it, 
I mean, I, I think there is a problem with flat deals. Um, one of the big, uh, one of the big uh, examples of a large, homogenous um, market, uh, twice the size of Europe, is China. Um, and if, you if you're not one lucky enough to get one of the 40 or 50 slots to release a film and on a profit share in China, then you can accept five or $10,000 as a flat deal and the, and the product is laid in front of whatever, 1.3 billion people. Big deal. Uh, these flat deals with, with Netflix, maybe it's a nice deal, but it's flat. You don't see a penny more. The pe people are interested in the film business. They, they've heard and they know that a, a lot of films don't make money. At least they don't make pe uh, money for people right at the, the top of the value chain, the, the filmmakers. Maybe people further down make, uh, make some money and make a living. They know a lot of films don't make money. But that when a film clicks, when a film really works, when it's a hit, my definition of a hit in, in a, for independent films is that your grandmother's heard of it or your mum has heard of it. That's a hit. When, when films really hit, then people want the super profits. They, they want to know that everybody, that the film's covered its costs and everybody is seeing, is, who's seeing it on a transactional basis is paying a, a euro and then a cent will come back up the line. That's one of the problems with a model where you're getting a lot of flat deals and a lot of, uh, of, of secrecy. We don't even know what success looks like anymore. Um, so is that something that should be changed? I mean, should as VOD platforms not do flat fees, but should it be tied to how many people have seen it or Bonus, like a bonuses? System? Maybe. Yeah, I mean, like this, obviously, I when you come to renew the deal, I think you should, you know it would be helpful to know if they if a, a, a million people watched it or twenty, um, and and there should be some reflection at least when you come to do to do a renewal of of the success that the services had had with that. Um, let's let's not forget they're also using their the information that 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 they have access to about how you watched it, what time of day you watched it, whether you paused it to make all their other decisions. All these things that are secret. Yeah, I mean to it's us. a very algorithm-based company. Netflix, obviously. I mean, they seem to live by you know analyzing their their data, obviously. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about. I mean, is that is there a possibility to create like an art, a European art house Netflix? Um, where everyone in Europe would know this is where I can find interesting art house titles? Why not, <laughs> I would say. I, I agree that we have to work on something to compete with Netflix if, if we don't want to be all eaten by the US. Uh, not only, I mean, I think there's also the problem that they're want, they want to have more original content, so this, they're going to push us out, basically, um, to, you know, more and more. And that's why I need, we, we need to support... Uh, this market within the European, um, board, well, within the European um, alliance, some kind of alliance, or I don't know exactly what it should be, but um, clearly I think there is something to be done, and I agree with with the strategy, the global strategy of the European Commission, saying we need to react. It, I'm okay with this, but it's just how we do it. Do you want to add something to that? Yeah, and I guess that promotion is certainly something very important, not only the promotion linked to the film, but also to the platforms. I guess that we all know uh, in our uh, own country, like the TV we want to watch, and we know the cinemas we are going, because we know that they have the, the, the kind of movies we love. And probably one possibility would be for to have platforms that are really clearly identified by, by the viewers, that they are the platforms, they have the films they liked. Um, we don't have any problem with Netflix. It, well, price is very small, but uh, I mean, and they are just interested in the local films or the American movies or the series. So it's not that they are, you know, they are not really a new booth uh, mainly for uh, independent distributors. It, it really depends where you are anyway. Um, so those other platforms, global, local, in the end, it's, it's a new booth. So if you can explore our film somewhere else, some, somewhere new, great, it's good. And if we can make money on it, that's even better, of course. But the thing is that some of those, because it's new, probably, because uh, it's difficult for, I guess, if at least that's what my friends are telling, are telling me, is that it's difficult to know where you can find uh, a film. So... Uh, Creating brands as they exist on other support, I think, is certainly key. Using brands to make those new brands known are key. I think that festivals can be maybe used as an attraction to a platform, saying, oh, yeah, you know, you like uh, Rotterdam. Yeah, we have uh, everything from Rotterdam here. Gothenburg Festival in Sweden has developed uh, an SVOT offer. 
So, you know, there are new things that are coming on. As you said, it's not only, only the, really, I think the sector is moving a lot. It's just that now we have to react a lot to explain that we are moving a lot and doing a lot. But yeah, you know, it's a Monty Python uh, thing. Um, but we are moving, there are things, but for sure we need help. And you were saying that probably it would be good to support the platform. I guess that support promotion online is certainly one of the key elements, not the only one, but a key one. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the Rotterdam's efforts um, with VOD and, and drawing attention to films in general? Yeah, well, um, it's it's um, it's a, it's a paradox that uh, the kind of films that are shown in festivals like Rotterdam are hugely popular during the festival, but when they are released in cinemas, if they are released in cinemas, they have a very hard time. So it's the event that drives uh, audiences to uh, to to the uh, to these films in the in the festival. So we had have, have been thinking about ways to to transplant this experience of uh, a festival beyond the festival itself. So uh, I started this uh, 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 project where we had the premiere in, of a film in Rotterdam. We did five, and simultaneously across um, 40 cinemas in 10 countries in Europe. And afterwards, the audience could um, uh, ask questions through a video connection and Twitter to the uh, people present in the, of the film in Rotterdam. And for us, it was sort of like an experiment to, to see how you can use new technology to engage new audiences instead of saying we are losing audiences because of these new uh, technologies. So I think like in general, like festivals can play an important role to help find an audience for artistic films also uh, beyond the festival. This example that I gave of the Sonar Festival, I think is um, interesting because it's a completely different demographic than like your 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 usual suspect cinema goers, much younger people uh, interested in technology, in progressive electronic dance music. Uh, they are like a great potential audience, future audience for a VOD platform. So for a VOD uh, film festival to partner up with such a festival, I think is a is a smart move. And in the future, I'm sure we will see all kinds of new alliances to to create appetites for for film and and. Um, uh, yeah, things will change a lot. Um, yeah, I want I want to talk a little bit about the opportunities of the uh, possible digital single market because everyone is talking about all the problems, and I think that it, I mean, of course, there's lots of things that need to be worked out, and a lot of details are not yet clear. But um, I'm sure there are opportunities as well um, that that will come out of this. And I'm thinking, for example, I mentioned earlier when we were talking uh, my French film festival. I don't know if you've heard about this, which Uni France organizes and. Um, in, co in collaboration with VOD platforms in, I don't know how many countries now, 10, 20, 30, um, to put French films out there where they don't have a distributor. Um, yeah. Actually, they are not just putting it out there, they are really, like, it's a festival, so this work of supporting the film is, is done, so I think this is a, a great initiative, for example, this, this festival, and we are working with Unifrance a lot uh, on this, uh, since the beginning, actually. And um, this is great, but it has this really um, specific work on the films. It's just not just putting them out there. So this is really important, and I think it's a great initiative. I think working with the festivals and uh, like festivals and VOD release is it's a great idea. But it's really proving that we need this this particular work. But aren't both those examples time limited? You have the opportunity for a certain period of time, then it stops. I think um, Mr. Ansip would have a problem with that. He'd say, well, it was available last week, now I can't get it. Yeah. But, <laughs> but if the film is not sold, for example, this VOD exploitation can just go on. Anyway. Um, any other opportunities that you're seeing? I mean, even utopian ideals? <laughs> or you're just seeing problems? Um, I mean, in terms of like the digital single market, should it happen? Um, will it, you know, what? I'm sure that there must be more opportunities. I think in, in, in some level we have to be real, realistic. There is, is already a, a digital single market. You can order any DVD from Amazon and uh, watch a film that you want to see. I think this. Um, <clears throat> the EU is quite right to 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 want to catch up uh, and to sort of like uh, recalibrate the whole uh, system. So so we have to make sure that we don't resist anything because we we need to move forward. 
Um, and also what, what tends to be forgotten, I think, is that the EU is an enormous supporter of uh, European fil film culture. They, they pour millions of uh, Euro euros in production of film, distribution of film. I think their heart is in the right place. They, they recognize that it's important for these films to be made, for them to find an audience. And I think um, instead of all this resistance, um, uh, the, the industry itself should really think hard of new business models, new ways to promote these films to make it work, because it's, it can and it must. Yeah, of course. No, I, I agree. I just, the thing is that technically, you know, when I'm, I'm selling my films, I know for even a multiple territory deal, for example, um, if with this digital single market, that would need that, that would mean that if one film is made available in a platform in France, for example, in its French version, it can be accessed from everywhere in, in Europe. But then the access will be to the French version. And I don't have the means to make all the local version. And what does it mean? It means that basically, it's not a, I'm not forcing it, I'm just asking the question, but wouldn't be the pirates basically who will get the files locally and make the subtitles and make the film available, they won't be the first one to do it. I, I don't know, but actually I am kind of, it's kind of my fear that it won't be that helpful to do it this way. I wanted to come back on what you say about the DVD, the fact that uh, um, you have already, uh, but it, it's physical. A DVD, but it's on the, you can buy it online. Um, but I mean, you can download them illegally as well, so in that sense there is a digital single market already. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true too. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but I mean, on the DVD, it, it is a problem uh, for certain, uh, certainly for certain countries that, of course, DVD can cross borders, so you can buy them in another country. And sometimes, uh, if the DVD is there quick, it really can you know, be a problem for some countries. It was a case for Ida, because Ida was released before in Poland, but UK has a huge Polish community. And so a, a big, big part of the DVD, the Polish DVD of Ida, was sold in the UK, not in Poland, but there was a UK distributor who had both rights and wanted to, to release the film, so it was a problematic But you wanted to him. release it much later than in Poland, I assume. Yeah. Everyone was much later. Poland released it like a uh, summer two years ago and the first country to release after Poland. I think it was like Germany around Berlin and then France, Belgium, UK in spring last year. So everyone was after. It was sold in Toronto. The film was already released in Poland. So, so anyway, that's the reality. Pardon? Okay, yeah. So anyway, before any other country okay so and um, speaking about the DVD just a little anecdote because they are already available actually Mr. Ansip was saying that he couldn't see Share of the Fire well I checked it was on sale uh, on Amazon Belgium for six seventy nine. <laughs> so it was available not on VOD maybe that at least I can't check that but it was available on DVD um Okay, so we have some ideas, um, but who should really be responsible for developing um, the digital marketplace then? Because, I mean, as you said, it would be nice to have maybe a pan-European art house, VOD place where everyone would be able to go in Europe to find these movies, but, like, who should take that initiative? I mean, it's not enough to have ideas. I mean, someone needs to put it into practice. Where do the initiatives need to come from? I agree that I think the European Commission has a role to play in this, of course. Um, and, and why not them? But I think that um, we, we are... The way we should tackle this, this problem is, is to go from the platforms, basically, because VOD is what we are talking about. And, and I think if the problem is uh, that, they, that you cannot access a French title from like an Estonian in Estonia because the film has not been sold and it's not on VOD. Well, why not helping um, the VOD platforms to open offices and uh, well, their, their platforms in other territories, for example, and it already exists. There are some European platforms that are opened in several territories. So 
maybe well, well it is pretty complex because there are so many opposing um interests so for example vud platforms would say uh, we have trouble getting titles for uh, our platform uh, titles that our audiences just wants to see because uh, the sales agent is still looking for a distributor or it has found a distributor but the distributor wants to you know is, is very uh, preferencing the cinematic uh, cinema release first so there's all these opposing um, uh, interests from because the but, the but they're allowed to because they own it Netflix you've got you I've got a VOD system uh, Netflix won't let me play house of cards oh dear you know it's because but, they own it I, and that's totally clear, but uh, if we're looking at how can you sort of like resolve this, part of the problem why it's so, so complex and so difficult to resolve is because of all the conflicting interests in the um, chain of uh, uh, production to, 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 uh, to the consumer. Uh, so, so, yeah, that, that's what makes it really hard. Uh, if you want to, yeah, I'm repeating myself, sorry. I guess that, as I had said, it, you, you need to work um, to improve the local market if there is not a market that is solid enough and probably in certain of the European countries they are still you know raising and building something so instead of saying like okay the film is not available there yeah well you can go as a I don't know a country a citizen of that country to the uh, UK platform and see the movie I think it's not fair for the country. You should instead say, okay, what can we do in that particular country so that we develop an industry, so that there is choice, there is accessibility in that country. There are, it, I mean, that's not only for VOD. Uh, you have a country where, unfortunately, you don't have theatres. I know it costs a lot of money to open a cinema. But I mean, we, instead of like trying to take the easy way, I guess maybe it's important to look also at a more complex uh, path to get somewhere, but that will have, you know, in the long term, a very better effect uh, on cinema, on circulation. Because really, also, if you open, um, if you open borders so that the people that don't have the accessibility to a movie in their own country, it means that they will go to another platform. Or they, will they know in which platform they will go? You know, there are 3,600 uh, platforms I've heard yesterday. Uh, that's a lot. So where are you going? So it's just like, you know, it took a nine miles to find things. I don't think it will really help the consumer in the end. It's just like trying, it's just a solution to say we have a solution. I don't, I don't really believe in that solution at all. I, I, I guess that I was pretty clear on that. <laughs> but, uh, but I really think that there are, I, we, we, need to be, we need to be proactive. And on that, it's true that the Commission can help us because we can have ideas, but we don't have always the means. So for sure, supporting platforms and you know exchange of ID so that they can be um, duplicated, etc., are, are good things. Um, and fight piracy is also just like you know. If I've heard that in Lithuania there is no video the platform, but everyone is looking at film illegally. You know, Where is this, sorry? In Lithuania. Yeah. Well, I think the same in Romania, where as you said, I mean, that's like a countries where there are practically no cinemas left. Um, there's not Very much choice for people to, to see movies except to go online and, you know. And in certain countries, then the cinema that are open are multiplexes. So they are mainly taking, of course, more the, the, the films of the majors and some very local commercial titles. And maybe sometimes, it depends, of course, where you are, some European titles. But, of course, the titles that are out of the business there are the European titles. So it's very important to create... Um, an existent for them, but as we said, you know, the, the film exists because you have a promotion, and mainly that promotion and that existent is built around the theatre release. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to very much agree with that and, and um, express my pity for a country that has no cinemas. Um, we we know at least one good thing you can say about China is they're building cinemas like like crazy, and I think it's important for us in the film industry to remember the unique. Um, nature of a, of a feature film scene with an audience in um, a good projection. Uh, we're not just talking about files sitting on servers, that not every audio visual clip, a seven second vine, it, it is uh, of, of equal, equal value and merit. Um, what's been happening with technology is that we, we started, whatever, 100 years ago with, a, with, very, with big screens, um, the, the TV became a small screen, 
but, and it sort of bulged out into the room and people sat, the family sat in a sort of semicircle around it. Then TV went flat. Now, now the TV has, is, is curving the other way to the individual that's sitting in front of it. Or then you're mo watching a movie on the back of a plane seat or you're watching a movie in your hand and next year Oculus Rift, the um, virtual reality, it'll be a different kind of product, but people will be making it, and it will be in your head, and you'll be so far away from the original collective experience of watching and being challenged by a movie that is absolutely essential to, to the independent film experience, but to, to the movie experience um, uh, in general. I, I don't, I, I'd like everybody in the room who thinks they're gonna be seeing Star Wars in, in two months' time to put their hand up, because it's certainly me. I mean, this isn't, a, and, and, we're, and we're not, even if we have the opportunity to watch a pirated version, we're not going to, are we? We're going to try and find the biggest cinema experience we possibly can. And independent films have to remember that that's the product, the collective experience, the emotional impact, not the downloading of a file. But I do think, I mean, that they can at least partially coexist. I mean, just because they're watching a film on their phone doesn't mean that they're never going to the cinema. Um, no, I mean, I don't think any of us are saying, we, we, we're not here to defend Windows. Um, I, I think most of us would say um, that the availability of a film on a platform should be entirely um, at uh, the decision of the people who own that, that right. And, and for a lot of films, simultaneous releasing in cinemas and uh, VOD is, is a great plan in that country not be, as a result of a well-planned marketing campaign, not just stick it out everywhere because it happened to be released in one town in one European state. And, and as Christine was saying, in a lot of cases, actually, the theatrical release helps the VOD um, career of the film. So it's really not... It is compatible and it is interconnected. Anyway. Um, okay, last question for you guys. Geo-blocking. Yes, no. <laughs> that's what we're talking about. That's, that's the defense of, of territoriality. You can't say, as I thought I heard Mr. Ansip say, we don't believe, we're not advocating pan-European licenses, we don't want to hurt territoriality, but I don't like exclusivity. That's, geo blocking is how you defend ex exclusivity. It's how you stop the person that side of the border from seeing what's available the other side. Um, a big yes for geo-blocking, of course, and uh, I give you an example to illustrate uh, why it's so important. Uh, La Grande Belletta was released in May during the film festival in Cannes. Um, at the same time, it, uh, it was released in France, sorry, in Italy during the film festival, uh, because of course it's good to play with the festival as a promotion uh, way. Uh, but that was for France, Italy and French Switzerland. The other countries followed. Belgium released it in September. Why? Because in Brussels, we unfortunately have only seven cinemas. That's not much for a city that size, but that's a reality. That's like that. And all those cinemas don't release, like Hande Bell itself, because you have very commercial ones. And there was a lot, a lot of competition. So the distributor decided to put it in September, which is a great month for this kind of movie. It was really good. And so, so that really happened. The film was a success, and it was okay. If you take off the geo-blocking, that means that when the distributor wanted to release the film at the best time for this territory, September, the film was available on VOD in France. We don't need publicity from a TF1, the, the French television to be available in Belgium and people watching it. It would be exactly the same for VOD platforms. The consequence is that the distributor wouldn't, haven't been, would not have been able to even release the film in the theatres because theatres would have said, no, 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 in Belgium we don't like to have VOD and theatre released at the same time, so we are very, very against it. So you know what, your film, I won't take it. And so it would mean that the option for the distributors were to take a very bad release date, it's somewhere between May and September, or just not taking the film at all. So it doesn't work. Okay. And, and anyway, for example, just um, I'm making deals for multi-territory platforms, so even with the geo-blocking, we can make films available everywhere. So what, what is the point? <laughs> what is the, this big problem, you know? The films are available in several territories in Europe, even with the geo-blocking today. Okay, um, I just want to open it up to the audience if there are any questions. Can you raise your hand so we can get you a microphone? 
Should there be any questions? <laughs> okay, we covered everything. That's great. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, then. Out there. Anna Franklin, Film New Europe. And it's, it's not exactly a question, but what I wanted to say is we already have some pretty good examples of something similar because I come from a publishing background. Any morning I can wake up and free online in any country, I can read all the newspapers in the world, which is great for me as a consumer, but the online revenues from advertising and people are very resistant to subscribing uh, has not brought that much money into the newspaper industry. But what has transpired over the last 10 years is almost all the local newspapers have gone out of business. Um, half the journalists have lost their jobs. Uh, it's devastated the newspaper industry. And most of all, the diversity of the content has been enormously reduced because since uh, the newspapers can't afford to employ a lot of journalists to create original content, most of the content now comes from a couple big universal newswires like Reuters, AP, and so forth. So while it's great for me as a consumer, it's been really bad for the diversity of the content and it's been really bad for the industry and very bad for employment within the industry. About half the people have lost the jobs. So I would say that while there's, of course, many differences between publishing and between digital uh, and film content, we certainly have a good example before us of uh, what can happen in another industry in, in places where there are a lot of analogies. And the diversity of the content has been gr that the consumer can read has been devastated. We have much less original content in publishing than we used to have with and much fewer professional journalists. So I, I just like to make that analogy. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. I mean, we also look at another highly disrupted industry, which is the music business. Um, in the old days, uh, m music acts used to go on the road and gig because it was promotion for their records. Um, uh, now they get a pennies from Spotify and their living is from performing live and I think you could say that the cinema is our, or certainly an independent film is our equivalent of, of going live, although a lot of the time it will not re recover the costs of promotion, so it's tough I, I agree, I think, the, I think it's a good analogy as well I think, if you are not doing this local work with films and everyone and everything is everywhere. I think the only ones who will perform will be like the, the biggest ones. And you know, it's, it's just the death of small films which would need a little bit more of promotion and, and pushing them locally. So it's good. Okay, any other questions? Comments? Was there someone there? No? <laughs> okay. Well, on that hopeful note then, um, <laughs> I'd like to conclude this panel. Thank you very much.